with a lot of autism tools. A very common question in Western tools is um, eye contact. Does this child make eye contact? In a lot of African societies, for example, sustained gaze is considered disrespectful. There are several examples in the data that I'm analyzing now like that of people understanding things differently. It makes me a bit uh, alarmed. I think the stigma is a big story. Once upon a time, my father suddenly asked me a question. He said, did your hospital give you any electric stick to protect yourself? You're working with uh, crazy patients. I said, no, dad, you are totally wrong. We are not prison. We are hospitals. We are helping mental health patients. But we don't have weapons in our hospitals. We only have medications. Even amongst the medical colleagues, the stigma was was incredible. You know, you talk to people, senior colleagues will be like, oh, don't do psychiatry, you know, become crazy. There's no prospects there, you know, go and do something else. In many parts of Africa, the only mental health services available are with um, spiritual healers. This is not doctor's illness, as they would put it in the local language. In Ghana, for example, in Kumase, we have sort of evolved vocabulary to describe depression in the local language you know, and it literally translates into sadness illness which is a bit more palatable to people so people are beginning to really grasp the idea that something like sadness if it is profound and deep and prolonged can result literally in illness you know almost one billion people worldwide live with a mental health condition when it comes to mental health all countries can be thought of as developing countries. One of the first mental hospitals in the world gained the nickname Bedlam. It's changed a lot. This is Bethlehem Gallery. Um, we're based within the grounds of Bethlehem Royal Hospital, which is a mental health hospital. For me, it's a massively positive energy. A lot of our artists are patients here. The kind of artwork you get is so interesting. If you come to an exhibition in a place like Bethlehem, talking about mental health or personal experiences that it's hard to find the words for, and that's a really strong experience in terms of breaking down stigma you might have. I try to use materials that are meaningful, like the discarded light bulbs from the wards. I took strips of fabric to protect them and bind them, thinking about what they had witnessed on the wards. I had to be very gentle, because as well as protecting them, I could have broken them. There's been an awful lot of campaigns in the last few years. We need to talk about mental health. And I think that a lot of people, including myself, have had some degree of skepticism because, you know, if someone has a severe mental health condition, that's not what people are thinking about when they're saying, let's talk about it. it it's not a sort of natural progression of things. You'll then be able to open a pathway for people to be able to talk about the experience of psychosis or mania or those kinds of things. Tanya Gurgel is Head of Research at Bipolar UK and works on putting the voice of lived experience into clinical practice. Within mental health care, we're trying to move towards interventions which can give the individual more say and more autonomy in their care. Advanced directives in mental health are a very, very straightforward, very simple idea. You've had a very severe episode of illness. You can think about what happened during that episode of illness, and you can think about you know, what went wrong, what was handled well, and how you would like things to be handled in the future. It's a win-win idea because it makes things better for the person with lived experience, for the service user, but for the clinician as well. It can mean that they're effectively getting a set of instructions which is tailored to the individual, which gives them an insight which they don't necessarily have in, in the context of a health crisis. This is a type of let's talk about mental health or mental illness which could actually make a huge difference to people. When I was 21 I became very unwell, like a uprising in some ways, and I became manic because I was behaving strangely and then brought here to Bethlehem and that's where I was sectioned. 
And the reason I wrote an advanced directive was looking back at a very young, vulnerable self who had went through quite a massive trauma that if there was a future me that became unwell again, it would never be as bad. I had a research residency here at Bethlehem Gallery, so I requested my medical notes. There was a massive stack of them, and there was a lot of misunderstanding, misinterpretation. Rich material for making art with. It was a strange experience because it had all been written by clinicians about me, um, but there was nothing in my voice in the whole stack apart from an advanced directive. So I do think there should be more of the patient's voice there. It's really important that we keep looking at new ways of doing things and doing things better. The way that we respond to mental health problems feels very different to how we manage physical health problems. Let's say I see someone with mild to moderate anxiety and I don't feel necessarily that they're appropriate to start medication, but actually some lifestyle changes and a course of CBT would be the most appropriate treatment for them. That patient might then wait 13 to 14 months for that course of CBT, during which they're likely to get worse. If we compare that to a physical health problem such as high blood pressure, we don't leave it 13 to 14 months. We would intervene before that stage because what we don't want to do is to end up with that patient having a massive heart attack or a massive stroke. We're very proactive. We treat that risk factor and that medical problem there and then. We don't really do the same in mental health problems. And the difficulty is then that those problems do end up becoming more complex, more difficult to treat. I'd gone from being in a job where I felt like I could deliver a good service to my patients to a job where I didn't feel like I had those resources. I was effectively on call every time that I was in. And then what happened was my thinking processes started to change. I started to develop features of anxiety and depression. I ruminated a lot. I really worried that I was going to make a mistake with my patients, so I spent a lot of time going over and over decisions that previously I would have made almost instantly. I started to have a lot of intrusive thoughts. I was absolutely exhausted. I had really terrible headaches, palpitations. I had this sensation of pressure on my throat the whole time. And by that point, I was just desperate. My head was an absolutely horrific place to exist in. I had a, a panic attack on the phone to my husband. I'd gone from never having a mental health problem to having a huge crisis in about six months. I have a lot of conversations with a lot of doctors at various points in their careers and a lot of doctors at the moment are expressing their distress saying, I don't know that I can carry this on. I'm thinking about leaving. I think it's good that we are starting to talk a little bit more about the mental health of doctors. But what's what I find very challenging is talk without change. And that's, that's where we're at at the moment. Um, particularly within medicine, but also I think in society as well. I think we need more services available, more effective and timely interventions. And we also need to look at society as a whole and think about how we're working, how we support each other, the lack of community. These are the factors that really feed into poor mental health and things that really do need to be changed. What we need is recognition at all levels of society and from people who have power as well, that this really needs to be tackled. What we are up against is systemic racism within the system, where we're overrepresented within the places of like our mental health institutes. It's time for something new. The MHIP project in South London is training community counsellors and bringing culturally relevant lifestyle advice, wellbeing clinics and psychiatrists into faith and community groups. Now we're getting service users, families, community champions, the, the bishop from this church coming together with us to design the services so that, and they are much more likely to know what will work. Shifting power resources out of institutions 
and enabling communities to be at the center of change. For your friends, for your family, anybody in need, anybody in crisis, anybody that has any issue to come and get early intervention. It's not just about mental health, it's about being well. Limited resources and imbalanced resources in mental health service, they're always a challenge because patients want to have more time with their doctors, but doctors always have more and more people. So how to balance these two things? In China, everyone has a WeChat account. So we develop a WeChat-based small apps to help patients to evaluate their severity of the depression symptoms. And also we will evaluate the side effects maybe caused by the medications. Combine disease educations about depression and also ask patients to do a simple six session CBT caused by themselves. We still have 10 minutes to interview an old patient, but in these 10 minutes, we can more focus on what patients want to talk about. So that will help patients and doctors have more like deep discussions and uh, increase the treatment outcome of patients. Yeah, you know, get the health integrated, you know, more and more, you know. Sort of like the friendship bench. I don't know if you might want to look it up. It's developed in Zimbabwe called the friendship bench. Grandmothers trained in like basic counseling. Good morning. My name is Joyce Chimbogero. I am a counselor in French Bench. Many people come here with social problems and family problems. And they sit on the bench and anybody who has an issue, you just come and sit next to them and then you talk it through. You know, it's done wonders in Zimbabwe. Doctors are also prescribing community activities for people with mental health struggles, acknowledging the link between healthcare and society. The route to better mental health for all of us means taking the best parts of modern research and old wisdom. When health workers and the public bring their knowledge and lived experience together, we can write the prescription for a more therapeutic society. In this, our 200th year, we draw attention to mental health as a critical health issue. To drive progress, we have two asks. <laughs>